What's going on, Winnipeg fans across the U.S. and Canada? You have now boarded the Winnipeg Terminal. I'm your host, Mike D'Andrea, finally back from paternity leave, and with me is Joe Pritchard. How are we doing, Joe? Oh, good. Uh, yeah, I can't complain about first place in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> no, not at all, especially when, to get us there, you had to knock off another one of the top teams in the NHL. So, I mean, that is that is obviously a cause for celebration, and... You know what else is a cause for celebration? Of course, I've been uh, off the last couple of weeks. We had our bye week, and last week, of course, one of the first weeks with my new daughter. But now I can actually drink on the podcast. <laughs> Got myself a summer shandy today. So let's crack a beer, let's talk hockey, and let's have some fun. What do you say? I like all of those things. Uh, I'm behind you on the beer because it doesn't quite feel like summer here yet, but we'll get there. Yeah, apparently. So for the uh, listeners that don't know, my job is a meteorologist. um, And now I've been on paternity leave for that uh, for almost two weeks now. And I have up until April 22nd is when I go back to work. But um, it's nice to, we were talking about this right before the show, just kind of unwind, take a step back. And, you know, I love weather as much as the next guy, hence why I do it for work. Uh, but when it is your job, it's nice to not even really give it much thought. So it's kind of been a surprise. And now my wife had a a friend here, uh, earlier this morning into the afternoon and she didn't know I was on paternity leave. So she says to me, she was like, "Uh, so how much snow are we getting tomorrow night? My response is we're getting snow tomorrow night. I, I had no idea. And apparently it's supposed to be like four inches or something. And I have still yet to, to look for it. Uh, or look at anything and so yeah i mean friday morning i may be as surprised as everyone else oh well no i think they ruined the surprise for you so i just hope you're hope you're ready for that um yeah uh, we, haven't, we haven't had to deal with it so i don't even know if my snowblower works at this point so hopefully it's not that bad i haven't even started mine at all and it's march 20th so it's like apparently i don't know about this but others are talking about maybe another one on like sunday or something that's supposed to be another big one and it's like are we finally gonna have to use our snow blowers like almost into april like what is this we've had a very warm winter where we have rarely had snow on the ground and now all of a sudden spring starts and then winter finally comes and says and another thing uh yeah it's just mother nature getting us ready for the playoffs i think right yeah winnipeg whiteout Let's go. Yep. Let's go. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I think one of the, the biggest things while I was on my paternity leave uh, from the show, of course, uh, it was on the day. So my daughter was born March 8th. And it was funny because before she was born, I am just like, you know, on my phone, whatever, hanging out with my wife. We're in the hospital. Um, and I got a notification that the Jets traded for Tyler Toffoli. And so naturally I was like, oh, this is one of the best days ever. And then daughter is born at 631 that evening. So I'm like, all right, this day can't get any better. Our boys are really starting to gear up for the playoffs. It's not like they're standing pat. Like we had said before, we were talking about maybe standing pat. We don't want to touch the team too much, but it seems like the additions that Chevy has made have really paid dividends because much like, uh, Sean Monahan, Tyler Toffoli has just hit the ground running. You know, you love to see it. Yeah, he's he's slotted in, and it looks like he's supposed to be there. So that's great. And as I talked about a little bit last week with our guest, he wasn't giving up the farm for anybody, and he's kind of split split up some of the pain, so that you might you're missing a pick in twenty four, a pick in twenty five, a pick in twenty six, in out of the first four rounds instead of. Uh, you don't have a draft this year. Next year, you're, you're back on it. There's, there's there's holes in the first four rounds for the next three years, but they'll all be worth it, especially if there's a deep playoff run involved. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, if you were to sell the farm for one year, like you know, this year's draft or next year's draft or whatever have you, for a strategy that the Jets have with that draft and develop sort of mentality, because they've never really made huge splashes in free agency up until arguably this year, they haven't really made any big 
blockbuster trades. So they are primarily a draft and develop sort of team. So it's nice that, like you said, there's just a few holes over the next couple of years because that's not going to really set them back once this core kind of ages out like we're seeing in Pittsburgh, so to speak, um, except for Crosby because he's just timeless. But um, anyways, like, yeah, it, it's not going to set you too far back, uh, you know, in a couple of years. No, and especially with the AHL stocked with talent and uh, – then and uh, Rucker McGurdy coming coming soon here, hopefully very very soon. The sooner Michigan's eliminated, the better. I'm all for that. Let's get let's get him on board. Yeah, there there there's depth to be had. So missing a couple of picks over the next couple of years to try to gear up isn't isn't the worst thing. Um, I do have to say though, I hate I hate looking at the wild card standings and seeing. Nash and seeing Nashville and Vegas lingering there because I don't like either of those matchups right now. One from yeah. historical and one from holy crap, they're hot. So hopefully they cool off. We got time. Yeah. I was gonna say we got time. Um and out of the two, I don't know. Like like you said, one is particularly hot and the other has history. And of course, the one we've we lost, it was not embarrassing because the third period they kind of fought back, but I mean, to give up almost 40 shots on goal to Nashville and, you know, not even get 30 and still end up, uh, you know, losing four to two. I mean, that Nashville matchup would be pretty tough. And well, as we've seen going into Vegas has never really, or well, I guess in this case we would have the home ice advantage, but we would still play at least, you know, two games in Vegas and that's never really panned out very well for the Jets either. No, but you almost you almost want to get them on in a playoff round in the next couple of years and just try to try to win one of them and kind of wipe away that stigma that that stain we feel about it. That yeah, might help. And, and, this oh, might be absolutely. the year to catch them. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, uh, it happened with the the year that we lost to to Vegas in the final. It happened with Washington. The biggest thing for them was getting past Pittsburgh. They just could not do it for years and years and years. And listening to Washington's radio call, uh, you know, of when they finally bested the Penguins and to hear the demons have been exercised. Like that actually is enough to give you goosebumps, you know, and I'm not even a Washington fan, but um, I mean, it was, it was huge. And of course it was enough to propel them and finally get, Ovechkin, the cup that he so rightfully deserves, uh, you know, as as being one of the the best goal scorers in the game. Yeah, and having an opponent that you constantly bump into in the playoffs and have trouble with, it throws me back to when I was growing up in the '90s in Wisconsin. I mean, Packer Packerland, right? You mm -hmm. you you've lived it now. You're you know how crazy we get. <laughs> It was like three years in a row that they'd run into the Cowboys, both in the regular season and the playoffs. I mean, in the playoffs, obviously Dallas was hosting because they were like they were running. They won three out of four Super Bowls in that time frame. But then in the regular season, the scheduling formula just kept sending us there instead of sending them to Green Bay. Like finally, like the year after the Packers won the Super Bowl, Dallas came to Green Bay on the scheduling formula. And if, you, and if you don't believe that there were a lot of um, uh, a lot of excitement around that and a lot of demon exercising, they even made a card set, a commemorative card set for a regular season game. <laughs> I'll have it somewhere. So yes, I, I'm well, I'm well versed in the idea of okay. We have we have history with this team. Let's let's reverse this and feel as good about it as we have felt bad over these past few years. Yeah, and now the team that seems to be the thorn in the Packers side in the playoffs is San Francisco. Oh, they're com they're that that bill's coming due soon too. Yeah. I mean, like especially with uh I, I think we're deviating here, but um especially That's with a guy like do. Brock Purdy. As, as I say, it's what we do. But um, a guy like Brock Purdy, who's still on his rookie deal, but like somehow lighting the world on fire and in the MVP conversation, uh, you know, you can afford to tool up and, you know, gear up for a Super Bowl winning team, which 
Now, my Steelers are kind of taking advantage of that uh, because Denver decided to pay ridiculous amounts of money to Russell Wilson to not play in Denver. And for those that are saying that, oh, well, Russell Wilson's washed, we're, we're talking about going from Kenny Pickett, who threw 13 touchdowns in two years, to Russell Wilson, who had a down year and threw 26 touchdowns in one year. That's a huge upgrade, if you ask me. Yes. Um, I mean, the idea, though, of not paying a quarterback much is that you have a quarterback. So hopefully between Wilson and Fields, you find one somewhere. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that uh, they're they're going to utilize Fields in some capacity, too. I mean, uh, this you know you were talking about uh, reminders of when you were a kid. Well, when I was a kid, Antoine Randall L., huge name uh, for the Steelers, who was a wide receiver but played quarterback in college. And they really utilized him, but like under center at time because he had the advantage. Heinz Ward was another guy who uh, played, who had a history of playing quarterback. But everybody knows Heinz Ward as this Hall of Fame receiver, you know. Like, but he, he was quarterback. He was a weapon time. on two point conversions too with that for a mm-hmm. while. Yeah, and even I before mean, that, and even before that wave, you had Cordell Stewart doing that for a while before they decided. Let's not utilize all of his God-given talents, and let's make him a drop-back quarterback. Mm-hmm. That went well. Yeah, that mm-hmm. went very well. <laughs> I'll just I'll leave it at that. Yes. But, um, yeah, now to uh, to kind of recap, I mean, we already hit on the, the game against Nashville, which, you know, wasn't a very great game. But then you have a couple cake games, we'll call them. Uh, you know, one at home and one in Columbus. Uh, but I mean, those those could be construed as trap games. But boy, oh boy, that the result that you wanted to see is what you saw going into a tough game at Madison Square Garden. You know, because the Rangers, of course, one of the other top teams in the league, uh, to be able to go into the Garden with a four to two win, and it was it was pretty. Hard fought game too. I mean, of course the the score showed, but I mean our goaltending was nothing short of stellar. I mean Hellebuck was the number one star for a very good reason, but then Shifley, you know, three Played goals. out of his mind. Yeah. yeah, got the Hattie, and you know that was a game where depth scoring might not have necessarily been there, but your top guns that you need to step up when your back is against the wall. I mean, Shifley got the hat trick. Kyle Connor got a goal. So that's that's what you need out of your big guns. And for a little bit, when we were having trouble scoring, it seemed like that was lacking. You know, even our depth guys were struggling to score a little bit, but they seemed to be the ones who were on the score sheet more than our big guns. But now when we faced a little bit of adversity and gave up 41 shots against New York, I mean – all four of our goals came from our top guys. So that's what you need. Yeah. Yeah. And it really, it does help to have your fourth line, keep, uh, keep a full shift in the offensive zone, but you're not expecting them to score and nearly as often as your, as your big guns. And when they, and when they're not going off, we've, that was, that was called January. So, (laughs) yeah. Yeah, so and, and you saw how hard the team fought that they weren't getting even the games they were losing or going to overtime and lose and losing or what have you, you know, two to one games because the defense was still playing amazing at that point. So, uh, really good that they found a bit of a balance between nobody ever scores on us and we never score, and now everybody's scoring a little bit more, but it seems like the Jets are scoring. More than the more than they're letting up, which is how you which is how you draw it up. Oh yeah, and you know to to go over some other games that were uh, on that um, on that road trip to or I guess on the end of the homestand, beginning of the road trip. There we go. Um, I mean, we had twelve goals in two games. I mean, six nothing against Anaheim. I mean, of course, like I said before, that's the result you want to see when you're going up against, we'll just say a lesser team. It's still NHL caliber hockey. So like they're, they're never a bad team, but you can always use that as a relative term, of course. Yeah. They're not the team you expect to, to meet up with in the playoffs. How about that? 
Right. Yeah, that's that's a good way to put it. Um, but I mean, it was just right out the gate. It's what you want to see. You know, Kyle Connor with the big goal in the first period, and then Nate Schmidt of all people to get the second goal. You love to see Schmidt on the goal sheet, and then all of a sudden the wheels came off for uh, Anaheim in the third period. And Tyler Toffoli putting the biscuit in the basket with an assist from his former teammate. Well, I guess current teammate and former teammate, uh, Sean Monahan. You know, you, you love to see the familiarity between Toffoli and Monahan, Toffoli and Iafalo or Iafalo. I hear his name said three different ways. I usually try to say it however I, however comes to mind. Yeah, it, yeah. But he's also he he can have many many names. He can play many many positions. He's just that kind of guy. I follow what you're saying. Yes, you do. Good <laughs> work on the dad jokes. <laughs> I was gonna say that's I gotta I gotta get with them. And um, for example, at the when my daughter was born, midwife says that uh, well initially. She actually asked if I wanted to deliver the baby. So, of course, I said yes, and I did. But um, then I had to make the joke that, you know, in hindsight, I'd rather the baby keep her liver instead of deliver the baby. <laughs> I know, they're terrible. And we're probably losing some listeners because my stand-up comedy career started and ended right there. But hate on it. Well, well, we we do we do know you got the dad jokes uh, fully going. Mm-hmm. So that's step one. Yep. The rest will come. <laughs> and Lauren's going to be a little Jets fan, so of course that's going to be there too. Yep. Uh, just like actually, uh, kind of skipping way ahead to something we were planning on talking about later, but I had the game on last night, and I'm my boy will lock in for about two three minutes check on the score, ask me what period it is, how much time's left, like all the stuff that's on the score bug. Like I haven't mm-hmm. taught him how to read the score bug yet, but we'll get there. But then he's pottering around the room doing whatever he's doing. Shifley has that nice breakaway last night, puts it in, and before the announcers are even like, haven't even caught up with the play yet, he jumps up and goes, we scored! And I'm like, oh, okay, doing good <laughs> at this parenting thing. That is so <laughs> cute. And I got to I got to tell the listeners, too, that, uh, you know, we had met up for lunch the weekend before uh, my daughter was born. And Joe and his wife, they uh, they came and, uh, you know, got lunch with us. They brought us a gift. And anyways, so I I open it and there was, uh, you know, a little um, like touch and feel hockey book uh, and a little uh, one of those little ring games and, you know, like a little tower. And it was really funny because apparently those were the two things in this pile of stuff that, uh, you know, you guys had offered us. Those were the two things that came from Winnipeg. And I was like, okay, I thought that was hilarious. But then to add to those gifts, there was a little onesie that you best believe she is going to be wearing. She hasn't worn it yet, but it's a little big. Mm -hmm. Um, It says, watching the Jets game with daddy. And I cannot wait to put her in that onesie on game day. And she'll have her hockey one, and she has her Pittsburgh Steelers one, too. So she'll be able to have her game day onesie for the Steelers, too, when she watches Russell Wilson take Steelers Nation welding, because we can't really say riding, because that doesn't make sense like it did in Denver. No, no, it doesn't. No, and and my wife might protest about how much time I spend on this and that <laughs> Well, that, uh, but it was her idea for the onesie. I want to put that out there. So. Oh, that was that was a like a nice little surprise. Like, if I'm being transparent, we had known that we were getting the the two other things because you had offered us. You sent a picture and uh, was like, "Oh yeah, that would be nice for Lauren and blah blah blah." But the onesie was actually not expected. So that was a a pretty awesome gift. So just want to thank you to, yep. to you and your wife again. That was totally, that was totally, awesome. totally her idea. She, she's, she is promoting the thing that she, that she gets upset with me about. So <laughs> 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 I just want that on public record. It was her. Idea. There you go. Well, Hey, I, I appreciate it. Anna and Lauren appreciate it too. Anna being my wife for the listeners that didn't know, I guess I never really name dropped her. So, and Lauren is my daughter. So, <laughs> There. Now now we've name dropped. Now we're on first name basis. There we go. All right. Well, 
looking ahead to some of the games that are coming up on the road, we've got tomorrow night at six o'clock central. We got a big game against the Devils, which we've done a, a couple deals with the Devil this year. The Devils. I, I tried to make a little bit of a pun there, but I like uh, I like where this is going for us. The l- last ten games for us, we're seven three and zero, riding a three game win streak. Now New Jersey has a one game win streak. Uh, they are three and seven in their last 10. So our top, uh, our top goal scorer last five games is Kyle Connor with four goals in the last three games. And Tim O'Meyer has three goals in the last five games, uh, for New Jersey top or top player in assists, Josh Morrissey with five in, in the last five games. So an assist a game and Jack Hughes with four assists in the last five games. And also that's their leading point score in the last five games. And our leading point score should come as no surprise. Mark Shifley, six points in the last five games. Hellebuck, the likely starter, uh, record 32, 15, and three. Goals against average, 2.3, with a save percentage of 923 and four shutouts this year. So, I mean, we've been saying it every week that goaltending has been nothing short of stellar and that is looking to be the case it's it's nice to see that at the end of march because we're really going to need it come postseason your defense can tighten up all they want but if you don't have good goaltending going into the postseason you're not going anywhere no it'd be a great time for him to get even more of just get even hotter than he has been all year that actually kind of worries me that he hasn't had a slump at all so yeah i mean it's nice that he has a, a solid backup in Brossois. I mean, he's, he's playing top tier goalie himself. He could be a starter on a number of other teams this year. Uh, but it's nice that he had that loyalty after his stint in Vegas to to come back to a place that he really. I think Winnipeg was kind of where he really found his footing. Uh, you know, I mean, not to say that he was bad before, but like he really kind of found his place. And I mean. To his credit, he found a a good deal with, you know, a a team that was sure to win the Stanley Cup. And here he brings a a cup back to Winnipeg, Uh, you know, so it's it's nice to see him suit up again in uh, in Jets colors. But now goaltending for New Jersey has been nothing short of abysmal. Capo Kakinen, 6-22-3 on the year. Goals against average of 381. Save percentage, 894, no shutouts this year. That really shouldn't come as a surprise when you have that. Uh, Jake Allen, 813-3, and three, not any better. Uh, 344 goals against, 900 save percentage, which is marginally better, and no shutouts either. So, yeah, you know, and a lot of that was in Montreal, so that's a little bit of a different – different defensive set to be behind so right we'll, we'll see if he emerges i kind of i kind of yeah. wonder if he, takes, if he takes the job and runs with it i guess we'll we'll find out about that but it's nice to see the abysmal goaltending when we're hot right now as far as scoring uh it'll be interesting to see in this game of course on the road so after a a pretty hard five game against the rangers so you know we, we can't always we can't assume that it'll be another six goal game, but I'm just saying it would be nice to see that. Yeah. I'll I'll take, I'll take the two points. Thank you very much. However it comes. Absolutely. And then we got on the 23rd, we got a game at noon, a little matinee Saturday matinee against the Islanders Uh, players to watch in the last five games, Bo Horvat with three goals and yeah, sorry, three goals in the last five games. Brock Nelson, three assists in the last five games, and Bo Horvat with four points. Of course, we already went over uh, our top point scorers. But now Ilya Sorokin, 22, 17, and 11 on the year, 303 goals against, 909 save percentage, and two shutouts on the year. And Simeon Varlamov, 7, 7, and 4, 286 goals against average. So not terrible, not great either. Uh, but 910 save percentage, not bad, uh, and two shutouts on the year. Uh, season series, Winnipeg, last time they played was in Winnipeg, of course, on January 16th, won 4-2. to two. 
And the Islanders in the last 10, 5, 4, and 1, riding a two-game losing streak. Oh. They probably play in between now and then, I'm guessing. But if that losing streak's still around, let's extend it one more game. I would have to say so. And then we got ourselves a, a back-to-back on that. The second half of the back-to-back is against Washington. No matter where they are in the standings, when you have guys like Carlson and Ovechkin cooking, I mean, it's still going to be a hard-fought game uh, no matter what. And, well, Ovechkin's had Helly's number in the past, too. But Ovechkin, three goals in the last five games. That should come as no surprise that he's uh, you know, their top goal scorer, John Carlson, two assists in the last five games and Ovechkin with four points in the last five. Uh, this one right here, Charlie Lindgren, St. Cloud State alum, 18, 11 and five on the year, 259 goals against 915 save percentage, which is actually pretty good and four shutouts on the year. And then Darcy Kemper, 13, 13 and three, about as even as you can get. Goals against and save percentage, not necessarily that great. 329 goals against, 890 save percentage. But he does have one shutout. And in the last 10 games, 6-4-0, and uh, riding three-game win streak. Last time these two played was recently, March 11. Of course, Winnipeg getting a 3-0 shutout. And likely, who would you want to see start that back-to-back? And who would you like to see on the back end? I would say go hell. Well, you're playing three games in four days, so usually you go hell about Brossois, But I could see them flopping that if they felt like it, so that that way you're not going helly on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, mm-hmm. and then having Sunday be Brossois. Maybe put him in between. But then again, I don't get paid the big bucks to make that call, so I'll leave the experts. And in this case, <laughs> Scott Arneal, because uh, Rick Bonus is out with medical issues going on so hope hope for a quick recovery on that front but yeah i the thing that makes the most sense to me is brosois on saturday but and he's and bonus isn't the only one that's out on uh, medical issues too of course got a little bit of a thorn in the side with an enlarged spleen with uh velarde mm-hmm. so that one uh that that's rough and, you know, nothing but a speedy recovery uh, for both of them. And, uh, you know, let's let's hope for the best. Now, as far as uh, Brossois, 12-4-2 and two on the record. Like I said, he could be a starter uh, anywhere. If not, Maybe not anywhere, but in a lot of places he could be a starter. 199 goals against average, which is actually better than Hellebuck's. Uh, 927 save percentage. Again, better than Hellebuck's. Uh, and two shutouts on the year. So what I would like to see out of this is I would like to see Helly on Thursday and Saturday only because like I said, Ovechkin does have Hellebuck's number. So it would be nice to see Brossois on the backside of that back to back. But, you know, like you said, I'm not the expert. So we'll, we'll kind of leave that to the bench boss. There's also a point to be made that Ovechkin has a lot of goalies numbers, so I don't think Kelly's making <laughs> that point. in any way, shape, or form. You're not one of the, the top <laughs> goal scorers in the NHL in NHL history if uh, if you don't have a lot of goalies numbers. So I'll, I'll give you that. Yeah. <laughs> and then we do return home to uh, Winnipeg to face off against the Oilers on the 26th. And I mean, they're they're always a, a hard fought game too. Zach Hyman, three goals in the last five games. Connor McDavid, five assists in the last five games. Also, eight points in the last five games. So that I mean, McDavid, uh, same thing as Ovechkin. You know, top player, two games in a row. You play against the NHL's best. So it's and those guys are gonna get theirs. It's a question of are you also letting their third and fourth line hurt you? Mm-hmm. If you do yes. that, you're done. Yeah. And Stuart Skinner has a pretty incredible record this year, too. 30, 13, and 4. 257 goals against average. So that's that's good. It's maybe not Hellebuck's level with the 230, but that's still a pretty good goals against average. 908 save percentage. And then Calvin Pickard, 10-4-0, 225 goals against, 919 save percentage with one sh- shutout. I almost said shootout. One shutout on the year. 
Edmonton in the last 10, 7 1 and 2, riding a one game win streak right now. Season series has been split. Uh, first game in Edmonton was on my birthday, actually, uh, on October 21st, Winnipeg 3, Edmonton 2. And then on November 30th, Edmonton comes into Winnipeg winning 3-1. to one. So this should be an interesting one. Power play is something that uh, Edmonton obviously thrives at, and that should come as no surprise whatsoever. 26% on the power play puts them at fourth in the league, where our penalty kill is 21st in the league at 78%. So we're, we're making improvements where we need to make improvements. And, of course, you're not going to go from – 75 to 90 percent overnight you kind of have to kill a few penalties uh to get up there um also 21st in the league in our power play that's showing improvement it's not as abysmal as it was 19 percent edmonton's penalty kill 80 percent puts them at 13th in the league uh goals for edmonton 352 that puts them at fourth in the league again no surprise when you have the weapons that they do in edmonton uh, for us, uh, goals for 315 puts us halfway, 15th in the league. Uh, goals against, no surprise with our goaltending. Winnipeg first, 234 to Edmonton's 282, which puts them at eight. Yeah, and I did notice I did notice a stat earlier today that the power play went from the teens from Mon from well, it was in, in the teens when Monahan was acquired. Since Monahan has been acquired, it's 31. percent Mm -hmm. So that first round pick got was dealt to give the Jets a power play. Yes. So it seems and, like a pretty good return on investment. Yeah, and who knows? I mean, like Money Hand seems to really be enjoying his time here, and he's definitely found his game again, what he had, you know, in Calgary uh prior to his the end of his tenure there. Um so who knows what can happen after this year? Is he a rental or is this going to be similar to a Stastny situation? Sure, of course, Stastny went away for a couple of years but came back. But uh, do you think possibly he might consider sticking around? When you find success that you haven't had in a while, it, 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 it would help the Jets' case in, in that regard. Now, is the money there? Maybe, maybe not. But if it's close, that might be a tiebreaker. Yeah, because you that. could always, yeah, you could always take a slight discount and like not by much, you know. Of course, go go where the money is. But you know, if if you are in a place in a system where you have found your game again, that earned you a bigger contract in the first place, why not take maybe a slight discount? Because who knows what could happen? Uh, you know, you you sign with another team maybe for slightly more money but the system doesn't necessarily work for you. We could find ourselves in another Montreal situation. And, you know, the Monaghan's not getting any younger, of course, not to say that he's old, but, uh, you know, then comes the potential buyout situation. You know, usually when someone's struggling, they get a little bit older, they have some years left on a contract or even just a year. That's where buyout comes in. Obviously what happened with Wheeler with us mm -hmm. and, you know, you, you hate to see it, but because of everything that, that he did for the city and the franchise as a whole. But at the end of the day, it's a business and you got to do what's best for business. And Wheeler just didn't fit that mold. anymore. No, best for business is what they did all last offseason to get us from point A, which was who the hell are we to point B, which is we're actually pretty good. <laughs> Mm -hmm. it's it's funny because i remember at the very beginning of the season there were all of these articles that came out on all these different sports outlets that said that the winnipeg jets are going to be a very perplexing franchise this year they're they're going to be interesting because what are they who are they are they going to be basement dwellers are they going to be that bubble team that they have been seemingly for the last ever since that 2018 run? Yeah. yeah um so it's it's nice to see that they've really found their game and the the deadline acquisition i mean and i'll i'll lump monahan into that of course it was about a month before the trade deadline but i'll just lump right but that's when that. you're starting to see the articles about hey the tra trade deadline is coming up oh by the way there's been a couple trades already uh yeah. that one's good and that one holy crap they spent too much on him <laughs> yeah and 
honestly, I wouldn't say that Chevy fleeced. I would say that he he made very fair trades. Um, and I I like what he did. And I think that for our counterparts in Montreal and New Jersey, for example, I think it'll set them up for success too. So yeah, I think their it's- franchises are in very different spots right now. So the trades, mm-hmm. when you look at the trades from an outside perspective, which I try to do just to, you know, just to, just, ha- just to try to figure out why was this trade made instead of going, Ooh, we could have probably spent less. No, let's look at this from both sides. What did they want? What did they want? They all they all made sense, which is why they happened in the first place. I suppose not a lot of GMs go go around making trades that don't make sense, but there's always right. a, there always there's always a loose cannon around from time to time. But except for rolling with, poles in Chicago, <laughs> yeah, yes, and, but not but not too often in the NHL. It seems like it seems like NHL GMs don't trade nearly as often as they used to. So yeah, something about job security or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, I don't know, like, I mean, long gone are the days that a guy plays for a team his whole career. Uh, you know, I mean, you you see it now, but it's it's very rare. And, it's, not, it's not the norm anymore. Right. And, I mean, even a, a guy like, uh, I, I do think that Crosby is going to retire a Penguin, but, I mean, of course, sure, he might have had a little bit of a tenure in Boston, for example, but everybody knows Grandpa Sharp, Joe Thornton, for example. Uh, and then to see him kind of a jump ship towards the end of his career, it's like someone could spend their entire career with a team, but uh, then at the the very end, you know, like Ovechkin deserves more than one cup, but I'm glad he got one. But who knows what could happen at the very, t- like his last year, do you think that, uh, that, that he might go to a, a cup contender even at the deadline? Well, I mean, Ray Bork was Mr. Boston Bruin for, what, 15 to almost 20 years, and his cup came in Colorado. So mm-hmm. even players that even players that would normally stay around and have their whole tenure, if, they, if there's a chance to go to a championship team, why wouldn't you? Yeah, and that's why I think that Crosby is likely going to retire as a Penguin. I think that he was a little... Uh, upset about the Gensel thing. Um, but I, again, like we said before, it's, it's what was best for business, but Crosby got his championships in Pittsburgh. And now I, yeah, he doesn't I have to go him. chase it. He doesn't have to go chase anything. The moment he retires the five-year clock starts. So, Oh, absolutely. Like, and, and trust me, I was a, a Crosby hater for the longest time. And I'll happily admit I hated him because he's good. Um, happily admit that. But it's like something that, for example, in football, Tom Brady, another guy that I hated for a very long time, uh, but then he got flipped to Tampa. He's at the tail end of his career, and I am kind of like more appreciating that I'm still getting to watch one of the best to ever do it. And that's how I feel about Crosby. I would say maybe the last two years, uh, the hatred flipped to respect. Just because, again, he is one of the greatest to play the game. And if you disagree with me, you're wrong. You know, I'm sorry. But, uh, like, yeah, I was the biggest Crosby hater for a lot of years, but that's flipped to respect now. Yeah, yeah, that, that'll happen as as we as we grow older and wiser. And as the players do, too. It's mm-hmm. not so fresh anymore. Yeah, and I mean, right now, I'm... It, going back to football, I'm in the Patrick Mahomes hatred. Like, I hate him, but I hate him because he's good. And give it seven more years, and I guarantee I'm going to watch Patrick Mahomes and be like, man, that guy is slinging it for, you know, it was it was great to watch him in his prime. And it, like I said, same thing. I'm, I've been rooting against him for 10 years, but, I mean, he's won seven Super Bowls, so maybe I shouldn't have. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly what it was like with Tom Brady because he demolished the Steelers even in the midst of their uh, – I mean, they they always have a good defense. It's always been a, a strong defensive franchise. But um, in the midst of their Troy Polamalu, Ryan Clark, you know, those days, Larry Foote, Ryan Shazier, he dismantled that defense like you wouldn't believe. 
and it was it was hard to to watch. So that's where the hatred came, and then I, I, it helped that he went to an NFC team as well. Like that that helped. Then you didn't have to root against him anymore. Exactly, and I, I found myself rooting for him in the playoffs. <laughs> yeah, you, why not? Why not? You, you're never gonna do it again. And you have mm-hmm. it, so why not take that opportunity to do it? Yeah. Well, I think uh, I think we can feel free to to land this. I know that we had our uh, little landing segment planned that we kind of already went through, but um, I just wanted to maybe touch a little bit on the the paternity leave and how things have gone, how fatherhood's gone uh, so far to to kind of land this plane. So uh, one of the interesting things about my daughter being born on March 8th uh, is, so my parents, they're, they're both passed away. They both died young. Uh, but my dad's birthday was also March 8th. So another, I'll, I'll even raise this. I really want to know if there's any stats nerds out there, I would love to know what the chances of this are. Um, but so my daughter was born on March 8th and my wife is August 3rd which is also my mom's birthday. And then I'll raise that even one further because obviously three, eight and eight, three. So like, I really want to know what the chances of that are. (laughs) Not high. I had, I would have to say. Yeah. So there's that. Um, But yeah, she was born at six 31 on the eighth and uh, she was eight pounds, 10 ounces. And I don't have a, a picture handy right now, but uh, thankfully she looks like her mom. Uh, she has a little bit of her dad in her, I could see. Um, but yeah, she looks a lot like her mom and she's going to be thankful for that when she's older. Um, but yeah, I mean, first time, first time dad. And it was the most awesome thing in the world when uh, I was in the delivery room and, you know, it was just about time to to deliver the baby and the midwife asked me if I wanted to deliver the baby and I didn't even know they did that I had no idea I thought the fathers were just kind of there for emotional support um but yeah delivering my own firstborn there's nothing like that they they put me in the gown and had the gloves on and everything too um but yeah I um I just I there's no words for it it was just incredible yeah it's something you're never gonna forget i'll tell you that much right now Mm -hmm. yeah it was um i don't know like i i'm speechless It, it was just like laying eyes on her the first time there was nothing like it and you know even i mean i have a very well behaved baby thus far and you know she only wakes up once twice throughout the night, uh, you know, cause she gets a little hungry. Um, but even in the midst of her crying at three in the morning or whatever, it's like, I'll, I'll be sitting there like feeding her a bottle, just like looking at her. And I'm just like, wow, I'm really tired right now, but I would not trade this for anything. Yeah. And there is a slight benefit sometimes to those midnight feet or midnight mid mid middle of the night feedings um and to tie in the bombers to this because we haven't mentioned them at all this show and shame on me but the first bomber game i ever watched after he came and he was like six seven months at that point Mm -hmm. yeah something like that he was a little little older but he had a middle of the night feeding he needed but the but the night before but so the it was the first game of the season, Thursday night. That was the storm game between Edmonton and Winnipeg. Uh, so we went to bed at, at halftime. Or it was halftime. I think there was a delay around halftime. And then there was a bigger delay right in the beginning of the third quarter. And at that point, I'm like, I'm tapping out. I'll mm-hmm. check the score tomorrow. I get up to do the 2 a.m. feeding. And they had just resumed play about 10 minutes before that. So I got to watch the rest of the game. <laughs> that was perfect but, timing. But, yeah, he so he ate and passed right out. I'm like, yeah, 
I'm going to regret this in the morning, but I'm finishing the game. <laughs> <laughs> I would have done the exact same thing. Yeah. Wish that would have ended a little bit differently, but it was still, it was still fun. Yeah. Well, did you want to touch on the bombers a little bit about the combine? No, nah, there's really nothing much I can add. The combine's happening this weekend or this week. It's happening in Winnipeg. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not a draft nerd in any sport, really. Sure. I kind of just, I rode the NFL wagon for years and years because that was the most impactful draft. And then one year I just realized pretty right before the birth of my son, honestly, like the year before it was, you know, it's going to happen whether I'm locked in or not. So uh, I got other things I'm going to do. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, you know, you can only speculate so far on the draft and it's like you, you look at mock drafts from all of the, uh, you know, all of the sports outlets, they're all way different. You know, maybe the first two or three picks are the same. And, it, and maybe they'll get seven out of the 10 top tens or whatever, but yeah. And then after that top 10, the the accuracy just drops off like you wouldn't believe it plummets because the, whoever's writing the mock draft has their own opinions of what a player needs to be that may not mm -hmm. match what a team team scheme needs said player to be so if he thinks the team needs linebacker he's going to say hey x team should get this linebacker whereas the linebackers they get are either way bigger or way smaller or have different skills than the guy than the one than the one guy the guy likes because this guy likes this package. That's right. where a mock draft's always gonna fail. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we'll we'll see how uh how the combine goes. We'll see how both the CFL and NFL draft go and uh and we'll go from there. Yep. I'm looking forward to seeing uh, to the the only reason I'm even looking at any NFL draft coverage this year at all is to see if they mention Quad Tez Siggers from the from the Argos from last year. It's like yeah. I know he can play pro football. Like, do you guys have any idea what you're talking about? So mm -hmm. far, no. So <laughs> <laughs> I I had some self interest in that as a Steelers fan because there was all the speculation of are the Bears going to trade away the first round pick and keep Justin Fields, or are they going to draft Caleb Williams? And uh, now, of course, as a Steelers fan, sure, his record, Justin Fields' record might not be great, but who did he have to throw to aside from DJ Moore? Good question. Who did he have at running back? Couldn't even tell you. Who is a stellar defensive player on Chicago before this year? And given I see them two or three times a season, no, I can't even really go there. So it's like, you think about that, they're, you know, of course he's going to have a losing record. And he started, Justin Fields started actually really coming into his own uh, at the end of last year, started, of course, winning games and really had that killer instinct. And so now I'm really glad that the way it looks, I mean, you couldn't draw it up on paper any better because Russell Wilson, if he's starting for the Steelers, you have Justin Fields behind him learning from a guy that he literally has admittedly modeled his game after. Like Justin Fields models his game after Russell Wilson. And, and he's not going to be asked. To, he's not, he's not going to be asked to be the franchise savior the moment he steps on the field either. Right. There's a difference so, like, there. Yeah, and I mean, kudos to Russell Wilson for sh shouldering that burden because you know Kenny Pickett, like everyone wanted wanted his head after last year, and of course he had a terrible tenure in Pittsburgh, but. I am not a Kenny Pickett apologist by any stretch of the imagination. I'm not. Uh, I am glad that he's gone. But I will at least say that he really didn't get that fair chance because his OC was Matt Canada. And yes, I'm going to sound like a Kenny Pickett apologist, but believe believe me, I'm not. Uh, but I will at least give give him that. Yeah, you would think an offensive coordinator with that name would have a better passing game, but that's just <laughs> I would think. <laughs> But yeah, he was, I was so glad the day that Matt Canada got fired. You have no idea. I was, 
And it was the same thing when the Steelers traded for Justin Fields, because now I look at Fields as the long term solution to Russell Wilson's bridge, you know, solution. Even if he signs an extra year uh, with the Steelers or whatever have you, like give Justin Fields maybe two years to learn under him. And how long did Jordan Love have to learn under Aaron Rodgers? And look at what Jordan Love did this year. Exactly. Three years of you're not even touching a football during the regular season unless something really weird happens. Mm-hmm. Go sit go sit in the room, go learn what go learn what good quarterbacks do. Go watch them on the practice field and play along as we're doing that. But you just park yourself, learn how we do things, and we'll call you when we're ready. And it's worked out very well. Jordan Love looks amazing. So well, I and guess everybody our... begged on the Packers for drafting quarterback when they didn't need one. But yeah. That's when you go get a quarterback. And Aaron Rodgers learned under Brett Favre. Same I thing. mean, the, the Packers are doing it right. Yep. So yeah, I got to give them kudos. I'm not a Packers fan. Sure, I live in Wisconsin, but they are doing something right with quarterback. They're doing everything Chicago isn't. <laughs> Which is everything we ever wanted to hear anybody say. <laughs> Yeah, you know, that, that's one of the things that, um, you know, living in Wisconsin, I get the Chicago hate, and I've I've embraced that. Yeah, uh, and it and it pits right into Jets fandom, too. It's so nice. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. So I can I can at least agree with the, the Packers fans and the Brewers fans on that. Yep. 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 Just join the club. Yep. All right. Well, you'll I think be one of us soon enough. Up. You'll be one of us soon enough. <laughs> yes, you could. You could say that I'm still going to be a Steelers fan for life, though. <laughs> Nobody's perfect. Hey, that's why you're a Packers fan. Yeah, <laughs> probably it. All right. Well, I think that'll that'll about do it for today, and uh, we can land this plane. Thank you. It's great to be back to all of our listeners. I'm glad to be back, and again, landing this plane for the dub. Go Jets, go. <laughs>